Thank you very much. And I want to start out by saying that um, I have been a troublemaker since the day I started in the profession, probably since the day I was born. Um, and what, what's happened to me, and it's come into focus, especially in recent years, as I've, I've, um, I've moved into leadership roles and director roles, is that you know anybody and everybody has a good idea. And there's not always a roadmap or a pathway to take that idea and have it be considered and implemented by the organization. And it's interesting because I've attended, as have many of you, many of the workshops uh, at this conference. And, and I feel like we're often, I think a lot of people are, are thinking about that. You know, how, how do you do that? You know, there's lots of great ideas. Oftentimes, there are, there's a lot of literature and a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom to share about how you know, leadership can move innovation forward. But how do you take those ideas and the inspiration and the identification of strategic needs that come from folks um, elsewhere within an organization? So what I'm hoping to do today is take that experience that I've had both personally as well as observationally uh, throughout my career and kind of look at, uh, here, was an, here was an idea. How, how, did it, how did it mature? How did it grow? And there's a lot of lessons learned in that. You know, there's successful and unsuccessful things along the way. And in particular, the lessons learned from both the successful and the unsuccessful um, experiences. So uh, my outcomes for today are going to be, uh, I'd like to have the start of a reusable um, model for um, inspiring confidence. <laughs> I'm, I'm changing words already from my conversation three minutes ago. Because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> I reload my presentation four minutes before. <laughs> um, inspiring confidence in, in all staff to contribute to innovation. All right, so, so you know, I, I, I say, a reusable model, but my second outcome is really um, to initiate or inspire or, or further, maybe, is, is more accurate, ongoing conversation among us practitioners about uh, how we can uh, inspire innovation from throughout our staff and our organization in our libraries and information centers. So I hope that you see this as, as um, a conversation starter, you know, a professional conversation starter, because uh, as I said, with every experience, I learned from my own uh, successes and, and, and hiccups, uh, but I also am taking a lot of ex uh, information that I've gleaned from other people who have grappled with the same initiative. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is gonna provide a brief, uh, brief background I'm going to go into some examples, tales from the front lines, um, explore, uh, do a little bit more of a deep dive into the lessons learned, and then I want to talk about, like, sort of from the top half of the organization, you know, how do you cultivate uh, a, 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 a culture of innovation, um, and, or how do you prepare your organization so that ideas can spring up and be considered and implemented. And then I'm going to talk about what anybody can do in the organization, no matter of your rank or role. Um, some strategies for managing up. So uh, it's creating, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you for example, is I'm coming up on my, the start of my fourth year at my current uh, role at North Shore Community College as the director. And I, I will fully admit that shifting the culture into a way of working is still a work in progress. You know, I have not perfected this, which is part of the reasons I'm interested in engaging in conversation with others, because it's an ongoing process. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've learned from my experience that there are strategies that you can do to help move your culture ahead, not just from the top down, but throughout the ranks. And that's, that's something I'd like to look at as well. So, where do these ideas come from? You know, where do people get these great ideas? I, I had a former colleague who used to learn to appreciate, and, and I'm grateful for that, um, although at her own peril maybe, uh, when I would start uh, a statement with the phrase, I have a crazy idea. <laughs> you know, so I'm that guy. I, I'm gonna talk about like sort of 
the troublemakers in the next few uh, minutes. And, and I'm, I, as, again, I'm a troublemaker and I always have been. Uh, not all my ideas are good, and I fully admit that. Um, and also, I've learned that oftentimes my initial idea is something that gets fleshed out and changed and modified and implemented in a very different way. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about too is the collaborative aspect of realizing a good idea and innovating. Um, so, but where do, where do folks come up with these? Now, um, many of you are gonna go back to your, your workplace and you're full of inspiration and ideas from the stuff that you've heard um, at this conference. And um, it's kind of nice that, well, I hopeful, I'm hopeful that this is helpful to have this uh, presentation towards the end of the conference because hopefully this will help you think about how you can take that energy and that idea and maybe help move it forward in your organization. Um, so, you know, talking to peers, when we get out and we talk to others outside, often outside of our, our home libraries and, and organizations, but conferences, especially conferences like this, uh, I'll again fully admit that in my early days, I, I used to come uh, religiously to computers and libraries and, and I would go back and every single time I would have this big idea that I was ready to, to make happen. Um, and you know, that's, again, this is part of where this, this, this passion that I have, and I will admit it's become a professional passion of mine, is how, how, again, how do you take an idea at any level and give it consideration and realization? Um, so I would go back and I would say, I want to do this thing and we'll explore some examples and see how um, maybe reasonable or even strategic some of those ideas might have been. Many of us uh, follow the literature and I use that in the broadest sense. Um, and again, somebody's always doing something cool somewhere. And you know, it's like, well, we could do that. And you know, the, the cliche is, well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think the flip side of that is, even if you should, doesn't mean you can. So, you know, we'll look at that a little bit more. And you know, social media is part of literature, obviously. Um, but also, the other thing is other industries. You know, and again, I, I, one of the things I love about this particular conference is I think we we tap into those things that are happening outside of of our field, and really look at how those applications are affecting us, or could be affecting us, or could be adapted uh, to improve what we do. Um, so. You know, we, we come back, we have all these ideas, and then the innovators, you know, I, I, I kind of, I'm gonna profile us, right? And I'll admit that I have aspects of all of these factors. So when I bring these up, uh, and I also am gonna talk about the resistors, I wanna stress that we are, uh, we are, there's two sides of the coin on all of these characteristics. And that's another thing I wanna explore a little bit as we go on. So there's the throw spaghetti at the wallers. You know, these are the people who, you know, their, their way of getting through life is, let's see what sticks. You know, like what's the harm in trying? Um, and, and also I'm gonna point out how a lot of these things are interrelated, you know. Um, so s similar to that, like sometimes the inspiration for throwing sp the spaghetti that we're gonna throw at the wall, I call the squirrels or the crows, because those are the people who are like, oh, the shiny new toy, let me go get it, right? Um, uh, I got this, I gotta take it. And, and again, I have aspects of all of these qualities in myself, so I fully admit it. Um, and then there's the folks who, um, again, I think oftentimes there's overlap with these qualities. There's the people who have their finger on the pulse. They almost have an intuitive or instinctual sense of like, this is something that has meaning. This is something that we want to develop. This is something that's going to resonate with our patrons or our customers. And, you know, again, they might get their inspiration from that shiny new toy over there. Or um, they might be willing to try more things, like their instincts tells them this is a good idea, so let's throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. Um, but these are the people who, time and time again, and I bet you have people, and maybe you yourselves are these people, they just have an innate, innate sense of what's the right thing to move forward with. And again, very much closely related are the prophets. These are the people that see the future, right? And they, they see where they wanna go, and they look at, they see opportunities and, and, ask, and, and, and resources and actions that will help them get there. Because they see where, the, where we're going, and, and they're the people who have a sense of how to get there. 
This is one of my favorites because I want to point out that you know, I'm talking about innovation coming from different places in the organization. So this is not just like library staff members. These qualities also exist in directors and managers and, and department heads you know, we, as well. Uh, so, you know, this is the keeping up with the Joneses, and this is one of my favorites. I, I had a manager at one point who, and my mother was like this too, <laughs> it's turning into therapy. But like, you know, they're doing this, it must be the right thing to do. Uh, you know, one of my more recent examples is a lot of times, uh, you know, OER, right, in higher ed, OER, it's all about OER. And I, and I, you know, in a community college library where affordability is a, priority, you know, and so the administrators come in and they say, OER, we have to do OER, OER is a priority. They have no idea what that means, no idea what that means, and, but, you know, this is checkbox in the strategic plan that we're doing OER, um, and I think that's a quality that you see with the folks who are keeping up with the Joneses, and to my point where not, none of these things are fully bad or fully good, um, it's true that you know, being able to benchmark yourself against your peers is, is one way that you can evaluate where you want to put your energy. And that, I would argue, is the flip side of the, we have to do OER because everybody else is doing it. And the strategists, the strategists, you know, these are, again, uh, very thoughtful and methodical. And you know, they're not going to do anything. Um, I have somebody I work with now who I Actually, she's an excellent foil to my qualities and my, my tendencies, but she's somebody who, you know, the minute something comes up is, is like, nope, our strategy is this, we committed to this two and a half years ago in our strategic plan that is still valid, so we have to stay on path. And again, the flip side of that maybe rigidness, if you will, um, is just that. It's a rigidness, it's a commitment, it's a persistent, it's we're going to get there and we're going to do it and oftentimes these are people who, you know, again, sort of intuitively or naturally work in very data-driven ways. You know, they're very good at using evidence to inform not just their, their innovation but also their assessment. Again, these are also the people who don't forget about assessment. They are committed to that. So this is a quality that is extremely um, frustrating for some of us, but at the same time essential and valuable and, uh, and the right complement. And I will admit, again, it's not all about me, but I'm standing here talking, so I'll tell you, is I have become a strategist. You know, I have gone from being a squirrel to being more of a strategist. And I, and I value, I've come to value the qualities of, of all of these sort of types. And one of the things I, I say is like as a manager, I, I kind of, I have these categories in my head because I can, I, can see, um, I can see staff members, people who I'm trying to help succeed and help contribute to our organizational goals. I see these characteristics and one of the things I try to do as a manager is say, okay, this is, this is ultimately a positive thing. What are gonna be the challenges about this way of working, but how can we leverage this perspective and this energy into the success that we need as an organization. And similarly, there are the sort of natural resistors. And um, again, I'm sure we all work with folks like this. Many of us may possess some of these qualities or might have our moments. Um, I've worked with a lot of eye rollers in my told you I'm the troublemaker. So I walk in the room and I say, I have a crazy idea. And there's always that person sitting at the table who's like, here he goes again. You know, what is he coming up with next? Can't we just do, well, again, this relates to another quality. Can't we just do what we've always done? Why do we have to do it differently? That's another uh, resistance refrain. Um, similar to that is we've always done it like this. Um, I'm, more, I'm part of a project right now where we're creating in, in Massachusetts a network of, at this point, predominantly community college libraries, but our vision and where we're growing is uh, a network of, of state-funded public higher ed libraries. Um, now this has is, is been, um, the challenge in this is that the initial uh, seven libraries who have um, started this all came from existing mixed type networks. So we're extracting ourselves from these long-standing sacred organizations to create something new. 
Uh, you know, that's a whole other presentation. I can go into that, that process and that experience, but where I'd like to sort of take this here is that um, that's an innovation that as the leader I had to bring to my staff. I'm the, not only uh, are we doing this sort of trying to do something totally different in the state, but I'm coming as a new director and saying to my staff, we're, by the way, we're leaving the network that we helped found, found all those decades ago to create something new. And so, you know, there, there again was, I, I literally, literally heard from staff members, you know, why can't we just doing it the same way we've always done it? Why do we have to do it differently? And so, when we talk about some of the implementation of how you initiate change is, it's really important to not just ask yourself that as you're developing an innovative idea, but be, be proactively able to answer that question. Why are we using resources? Because even thinking about innovation and considering it is using resources um, for something if it works perfectly fine the way it is. Um, the other, the other thing is, I'm sure you've heard this before, or again, maybe you've uttered this phrase, is we tried that before and it didn't work. That's one of my favorites, uh, I say ironically, because in fact, you know, there's probably very good reasons by, why it, it didn't work the last time you tried it. And some of it is potentially the process you used to consider and implement it. So, you know, but, but the thing about it is, and this is one of the things I articulate to, to the staff I work with a lot, is the external conditions are constantly changing. You know, so when you reassess, you know, your, your, your actions, your strategies, it's good to know your history and it's good to understand your experience and what you've learned from that. I mean, this, this presentation is all about that but it's also good to recognize that the external factors are constantly in flux and they need to be considered within the context of what you're trying to do now. Um, so I started out life as a reference librarian and I worked at an organization where uh, we were serving healthcare and, and social work professions and so the idea, and again, many of you are familiar with this, of the evidence-based practice model. You know, I know we talk about that within our own profession but one of the best models I've ever seen for that is the triangle, right? Where you have the data, you know, this, the data, the evidence that you use to make a decision. And because that's such a change for so many people, a lot of people associate evidence-based practice with data. But, and, and for better or for worse, either they say that's the best thing in the world, we should be using data to make all of our decisions to yeah, but what about all my experience and I've been in this field for 30 years and I have intuition and you know, and you don't know the people, you know, the clients I'm serving. So that's where the two other arms come in. You know, the two other arms come in because just as equally valuable as the data is the professional wisdom and then the environment, you know, the, the customer, the client, the patient, right? That, that individual is, or circumstance is bringing in its own uniqueness. So data, you know, I, I, data driven is often in the form. I like the, I like the, the term data informed um, because data on its own is not giving you those two other aspects. And professional wisdom is absolutely as valuable to consider, not more, not less. It's all part of that. So I'm harping on this. Um, we tried it before and it didn't work because again, I think that experience of trying it before and learning from what didn't work has to be part of the consideration and if, if appropriate implementation, but it can't be the reason you don't do it again. So I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of, um, that I've been part of in one way or another that sort of have informed some of my ideas around how to cultivate um, a place where folks can contribute to innovation and change. So when I was um, first starting out, I, this is a true story, um, dinosaurs still roam the stacks and all that stuff. And I came back from computers and library and there was all this kind of stuff about 
we were still calling it virtual reference at the time, essentially chat reference, right? And there weren't really library vendors for this service. We were using, um, you know, we were using, you know, enterprise from, from other industries. Um, you know, we were all talking about how innovative Land's End was in this realm. <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers this, but this was a big deal, right? So I come back, I'm like this freshly minted librarian, and I come back from computers and libraries, and I say, we have to do this, you know? And part of it was is like I could see how this would you know help our users, but I wasn't you know so I had that sense of it, but it wasn't really based on a strategy of this is something our users need. The you know the value of implementing something like this outweighs maybe putting our resources into some other strategy or other project. So I spent a good year you know clamoring, whining, complaining, feeling frustrated that you know, nobody could understand why this was so important. Um, and I made early efforts at things like proposals and justifications. But what they really were, were um, manifestos. <laughs> and I'm sure we've all been there, you know? Like this is about justice and access and you know, all these fancy things. It was completely detached from anything like, again, what are the priorities of our organization? What's our strategy? You know, what is the, how are we going to measure the impact? You know, who are we, who are we affecting and why? Why is that what we want to affect? So needless to say, it went nowhere. I mean, I did a lot of legwork. I talked to a number of vendors. I gathered, you know, I did gather some data about impact based on the small number of examples that were there. Um, but what, what I didn't do is really come at this from a very, you know, strategic or um, informed by the needs of what were actually existing with our, with our patrons being faculty and students. About a year and a half later though, um, the birth of distance and online programs occurred at the college. And one of the things that we was grappling with as this was happening is that age-old statement is that we have to ensure that, you know, distance and online students have equitable resources. You know, they have the equitable resources of the on-site people. And so, you know, one of the things that was literally coming from some of the planners, external to the library and even external to the college, was the idea that, you know, well, how do you provide library services? You know, and, you know, again, these are the days of, and I know this still happens, but this was the days of a lot of literally mailing books to, or FedExing books to people's homes and things like that. You know, those were the solutions for equitable access. But in addition to that was reference services and support services. So this you know, comes up and there's all this talk about how are we gonna do this? And well, fortunately I had some experience that we tried before and didn't work with looking at, um, you know, again at the time we called this virtual reference. Um, and I was able to draw on that experience but work with the team of people and develop a proposal and a project plan where we were able to say, here's how we're gonna address this need. But not only that is here's how, here's what the impact is. You know, like what, what are the needs of the, of the students in this program that we know about based on the data we have with the onsite? What are gonna be the challenges of meeting those needs if they're not in our library or even in our state in some cases? So with that, able to develop a proposal um, that could speak to that and ultimately wasn't about Rex innovating the thing he wanted to do because it was cool but it was actually about meeting the known needs that had emerged in the organization. It was a very successful project. It was even funded externally. We got grants from the college as well as externally um, and, and again learning from I had tried it before and it didn't work but I didn't stop there. Um, but quite frankly is engaging as an individual practitioner with this thing that I had a spidey sense was important, you know? So I didn't ignore it. It's not like this isn't on our map, this isn't on our strategic plan, I'm not gonna even think about it. What I learned from that is while I put more in it than I should have, it was a valuable experience to engage with something that I had an innate sense was important and forecasting its value maybe down the road. So, and oh, by the way, you notice these aren't links. I'm not going to show you anything because these are the days when I wasn't really aware of the need for documentation and planning and transparency <laughs> and communication. So, 
uh, flash forward maybe 15 years later, and I am, uh, I'm a department head, and one of the, the librarians uh, is very justice oriented. And you know, yeah, <laughs> just one of them, just one, nobody else. None of, none of the rest of us, right? But is really looking to infuse social justice ideas in all of our services and all of our resources. And, and again, that's an admirable thing. And it and actually was very appropriate and aligned with the strategic plan of the college and the university. Um, and also, you know, don't say but, and also it was sort of separate from that. It was, it was driven by an individual's uh, perspective about what, you know, what would be effective, what was important. And, and I'll be quite frank, what was interesting? You know, so uh, there were a couple of projects that emerged from this energy. And one of them was around a makerspace. So this is kind of like OER, and I, I know this is true in a lot of libraries too, is you know, the director came down and said, and even the provost, you know, we have to have a makerspace. <laughs> you know, so, okay, well, what does that mean to you? I have no idea what that means to me, but we have to have one. Well, here's what you know, that could mean. And, um, and so essentially, I remember early on, I was, I was charged with uh, having a cross-campus meeting with different stakeholders, different people that were clamoring that we needed to have a makerspace. And one of the exercises I did is I actually, and by the way, I was very low ranking at this table. <laughs> like, I was a nobody and I was sitting at a table with some very influential people. So who did I think I was? But I asked everybody at the table to say, go around the room and one by one say, what is a makerspace? You know? And then I, after we did that, I said, well, what do you think a makerspace would look like here? And then after I did that is, what wouldn't a makerspace look like here? Because at that point, they had heard what other people had said. And so they could sort of eliminate things as like, no, that, to me, that's not important. Um, that was a very useful exercise that gave us a lot of data and got us nowhere. Because again, I didn't have a lot of authority or influence to move it forward. But fast forward a little bit later, and we have sort of a homegrown makerspace vision that's coming in. And, and so this person comes and says, we have to do this. It's not going to cost a lot of money. That's another thing I want to talk about. It's not going to take any additional staff. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and look at this. And I'll, and I'll show you. I'll scroll down a little bit and show you in this proposal that This is all we need to get started. We just need a little bit of space, a couple of non-consumable items, and some other consumable. And that's all. That's all it's going to cost. Nothing else, right? So as I was scrolling through, I know you're not looking closely at this, but this person who I was managing, and I asked her to put this in a format, is like, well, what, what are, you know, why are we doing this? What is your vision? First, summarize your vision. Why are we doing this? Um, what are the goals of the project? Um, you know, a big part of this because it had already been a cross campus uh, conversation was who, you know, the collaboration aspect of it. But essentially, what, what was created here was something that on the surface answered kind of the idea of what strategies were, but it didn't tie to any actual strategies or library or university. Uh, action items or goals, you know? It was something that was related to it, but separate. Now, ultimately, the, the makerspace did happen in this vision, in part because on the surface, it was no cost. Now, I didn't, I didn't actually fully endorse this. You know, this is one of those where I, as, as the manager, I said, no, I, you know, I don't think this is fully fleshed out. I don't think this meets our needs. It's not part of our strategy. But, I, you know, that wasn't what ended up happening. Well, interestingly enough, it, it's, and then one of the slides is titled a little later on, if you build it, they may not come. So there was a small, literally like fewer than a dozen people who used the space. There was no plan, there was no real vision, there was no actual purpose. It was just, we had a makerspace. It was unique to the university because it spoke to, you know, it was a makerspace that was very non-digital. 
you know, it was, you know, craftivism you see right in there, you know. It's all great, but again, it was totally disassociated from vision. So not surprisingly is the university makes decisions to do things differently and uh, the library loses a significant amount of space. And so one of the first things to go was the makerspace, which was really just this standalone kind of element. So there's an example of somebody, you know, getting the ability to articulate a vision, even getting approval on it, but taking it out of context. Um, ultimately meant it, it really wasn't, it wasn't successful in the long run. And so that's another point we're going to drill down into. So I alluded to earlier the notion that um, that I've been part of a project to start a new network. Uh, the name of the network is HELM, Higher Ed Libraries in Massachusetts. And this is an interesting thing because this was I, my first day on the job. I'm going to tell you this right now. A, worse, a new director's worst nightmare is to do what I did. <laughs> you know, I told you that I, I'm a troublemaker, and so this project on the surface might be, seem like just the kind of thing that I would get involved with. Like, if there's trouble, I'll find it. But it actually was the last thing in the world that I expected or wanted. But my first day on the job, I can still see the college president pointing at my budget at the line that was the network fee and saying, you need to understand and justify this expense. And it, it really didn't take me long to realize not only was, were we not getting the value we needed out of it, but the actual dollar amount was something that was extremely unsustainable. So it was both a value and a direct cost issue. Uh, so without going into a lot of details, um, I had to take this directive of making a decision about our affiliation with the, with the cost that we were taking. So it was directed by, you know, the president's asking me to make this decision, but at the same time, I had to turn it around into a proposal. This is what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it. This is what we expect the impact to be. This is how we're going to measure the impact. This is why it's ultimately going to benefit the college. The interesting thing was that a harder sell than to my bosses was to my staff. So this is a really interesting process because it was ultimately my decision to make this, but I had to incorporate the input from people who had experience and had input on this, which were the staff. Um, when I walked in the door, I, I had a staff, the culture was very resistant. You know, we're, we're trying to change that a little bit because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> um, but the initial kind of personality of our staff was resistant. We can't possibly do this. We can't possibly do this. And so when I wrote this proposal, the proposal was as much for the people who had to ultimately approve it as it was for the staff who had to buy into it. So that's another thing I want to drill into a little bit more. OK, so uh, what did I just do? So these are kind of some of the points I want to talk about with lessons learned is, as I said earlier, if you build it, they may not come. And a couple of things to think about is when it comes to innovation, you, you do need to detach yourself, you know, avoid pet projects because the thing, you, you know, there's a fine line between I'm passionate about this because I know it's the right thing to do and yeah, I'm interested in it and all that. And I really want to do this just really want to do this. And I, I would argue that the, the makerspace vision was something that was a pet project. It was an individual's, this is really cool, I'm passionate about this, as opposed to I'm passionate about this being the right thing for us to do. And I've done that plenty of times. I've invested in, oh, arguably the initial foray into chat reference was a pet project of mine, you know? What's interesting is I'm passionate about Helm. But I'm not passionate about it at home. Like I said, it's not necessarily something I wanted to do. And when I realized I had to do it, I had to invest in antacids because it was, <laughs> it was hard. But I've become passionate about it. And I'm passionate about it because I believe strongly how much this means, not just to North Shore Community College, but to public higher ed in Massachusetts in general and our students. You know, So there's, there's a fine line between that, the, the personal pet project and the passion that you have. Um, 
The other thing is, and I'm sure this is sort of a cliche too, but I come back to this all the time when people talk about, we should do this, we should do that. Don't solve problems that don't exist. You know, so there's innovation that's around, you know, uh, you know, addressing strategic priorities. You know, it's, it's creation, right? But there's also innovation, which I think is some of the most exciting stuff. That's also a big shift for me. You know, it's, it's not it's not the sexy stuff, but in the end, it's it's really where you can make an impact. Is you know, workflow efficiencies. You know, I sound like a tech services librarian, but it's true. It's, you know, that's the kind of innovation that has really lasting input and actually oftentimes allows you to pursue the creative innovation. You know, because so we're all overworked, our staffs are all overworked, we're all spinning a gazillion plates. The efficiencies that we can create in our, in our work free up time, energy, and also sometimes money to do the creative innovation. Um, so don't solve problems that don't exist. And that's a question to ask yourself both as an innovator and maybe as a decision maker, you know, when you're, when you're considering something. Um, don't innovate alone. Now, again, I'll go back to my example with the, with the uh, virtual reference is that my initial foray into that, I was alone. You know, it was me. It was my pet project and I was pushing it forward with my stubbornness and my energy. <laughs> um, um, but also the example of, you know, the makerspace that was initially successful, right? The reason why it was initially successful is that the staff member did manage to incorporate other people, you know? And again, I, I'm not in a million years saying I told you so, but like my reservations about that were again about its focus. But the reality is, is the initial success of getting it launched had a lot to do with the fact that it wasn't done as an individual. It was done collaboratively. Um, don't wing it. You know, we'll talk about this a little bit when I show you an example, but, you know, this is, you know, the let's see what sticks, throw the spaghetti at the wall and let's see what sticks. Um, so a lot of innovation is going to be iterative. So I'm going to go back to my Helm project, working with six libraries, collaborating with an existing system, you know, we were making decisions based on information we were gaining as we went. So we knew where we were going. We didn't know exactly how we were gonna get there and we couldn't know because it was an entrepreneurial, it's an entrepreneurship phase. But that's, again, it's different than winging it. You know, there had to be so many people involved, uh, stakeholders and participants. We had to be transparent and we had to be deliberate about where we were going. But what was frustrating, especially to library staff members in our member libraries was we weren't able, we weren't always able to tell them this is exactly what's going to happen and this is exactly how we're going to do it. So it was iterative, but by no means did we wing it. So again, that's, that's that flexibility and nimbleness to engage in real innovation is oftentimes going to be like that. It's often going to be the kind of thing is you know exactly where you're going and you know you're going to get there. You have an outline, that outline is subject to change. And the other thing, I didn't really address this much, but I think this is another thing we see, and you know, again, I am especially a lot earlier in my career, although it's something I have to check myself with even now, is don't start something new before you finish. <laughs> and so when we look at the, um, the, the models I'm gonna show you for proposals and things like that, you're gonna see that for example, assessment and oper oper operationalizing is a big, important step. Five minutes, got it. All right, so lessons learned, what to do. Uh, talked about sort of what not to do. Align with priorities. Um, you know, understand what not just your priorities in your organization are, but the priorities in, in, in who you report to. So in an academic library, it's oftentimes gonna be the college or university. You know, what are, you know, does, there's a strategic plan and there's probably a tactical plan and how do you align with that? Um, as I said earlier, it's not the sexiest kind of innovation, but it's oftentimes ultimately the most exciting and impactful. Solve problems that you identify and identify efficiencies that you can, you can implement. Secure buy-in, but also support. So if I go back to my Helm project, I'll tell you right now that there was lots of buy-in, but there was no sort of formal commitment of support from 
uh, units outside the library within the college. And that was problematic because you know, nobody wants to be told they feel like they're surprised that they have to do something, um, even though there was a formal signed by the president of <laughs> project approval. Um, as I said earlier, collaborate. These are the flip side of some of the things I said on the last slide. Collaboration, uh, planning, assessment, and ultimately persistence. Um, in order to have success with Helm, uh, myself and staff members in the library had to exercise a ton of persistence. Um, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to talk more about this, but like um, engaging all your staff in your strategic plan. And this could be at a departmental level. It doesn't have to be a library level. It could be at a smaller level. And I, and I have some examples of that is, uh, you know, find ways to, to to query your staff, like, you know, okay, here's what the college says is our priority. What does that mean to us, you know? Um, or another question I like to ask is, what do you think we're doing well? What do you think we're not doing well? What do you think we're not doing enough of? What do you think we're doing too much of? Because that's the other thing about innovation. It does come at a cost, and we're not getting more resources. So a lot of times you have to let go in order to take on. Um, Another thing is uh, developing a process. That's what I'm going to share with you in a minute. Um, but also uh, communicating expectations. So this is a big thing I've become a big fan of, is creating cycles of consideration. So most recently with this Helm group, there's this question of how do we, how do we change the policies? Because we have, you know, at this point, nine libraries now. How do we decide? We went with this, and it made sense. But how do we reconsider our policies? Um, so what, we've, what we're creating is actually a cyclical cycle. So once a year, there'll be a period where anybody can bring uh, a policy change to one of the working groups. All the working groups have the, the ability to look at that, consider it. If it's deemed that's something that we want to actually change, it comes to the directors. The directors approve it, and it's implemented on January 1st. So, so this process starts in October. If somebody comes in August and says, this policy, I really think we should think about it. We don't have to say no. We can say yes. In October, here's the process you can use to bring this change. Um, so finally, uh, well, inviting proposals, and that's related to that, is creating a mechanism, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and allowing for the freedom to fail. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over this really quickly, because I do want to get to the meat of this. Um, management can do a lot to create a culture of innovation. Um, creating a culture where you're allowing staff to use project management strategies. You're insisting on assessment, but you're also acting on assessment. Um, you're, you're insisting on opera operationalization plans, um, but you're also celebrating success and rewarding effort. That's the freedom to fail. But ultimately, anybody, whether it's a director or a library assistant, has to understand that if you have an idea, you got to sell it. And you got to sell what they want to buy. Everybody answers to someone. So you're not just selling it to Rex. You're selling it to the provost and the president of the college. So what's important to the president of the college? What's important to the provost? Because I'm going to sell it to them. So when you come to me, I got to be able to, at least theoretically, sell it up the food chain. Um, arrange for external endorsements. You know, people up the food chain like to hear from somebody else. If the library says we need more money, eh, of course they're going to say that. If faculty senate says the library is being underfunded, it might get a little bit more uh, consideration. And this is just a thing. When you're selling up the food chain, make them think it's their idea. Don't be concerned about getting credit for innovation. I'm more than happy to allow folks to take glory for my initial idea. Um, so I'm going to show you two examples of proposals. And my point about this is whether or not your organization has a process and a formal form or whatever to make a proposal, you can still sell your idea up the food chain using these strategies. So the first example I want to show you is actually one that is a little bit um, uh, rudimentary. But this is something produced by a library assistant at my current college. 
Um, so she is the lowest ranking of the, of the full-time staff. But guess what? She's full of ideas. She's brilliant. She's got her finger on the pulse. She's engaged with the community. She works on the front lines. And so she would come to me and say, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I realized what I had to say to her is, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? What do you think is going to happen as a result of it? Who is it going to affect? And how are you going to know it did what you wanted it to do? Um, gives me a brief project description. And you can see that this is not fully uh, realized. I'm going to show you one more because we are out of time. This example is a project plan that I created um, to get funding and resources and endorsement to create a comprehensive uh, course reserve uh, program. So I, this is done in collaboration with our access services team. But ultimately, I had to sell this up the food chain. So here's what we're doing. We're requesting one-time additional funding so we can, we can seed this project. Um, here's what the impact is going to be. Why are we doing this? One of the main priorities at our, at our, you know, at our college is, is affordability. We, our students are, many of our students are homeless and hungry. Um, here's the scope of what we're doing, which oftentimes can be a statement of, this is not what we're doing. Some of the stakeholders, goals and objectives, and you can see they're mapped directly to our strategic framework, including the goals, the objective, and the rationale how we're going to assess the outcomes. Here's our initial timeline. And the basic project plan, as I said, which would be ongoing and iterative. And so this is going to segue into what we didn't talk about in this, which is how do you use agile project management and other kind of strategies to once you say, all right, we're going with this, to keep the conversation going and moving forward in a productive way. Any questions? I went over, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.